tries to tell me that I have a warrant uh, from my ho uh, original home state. Well, I know that's bullshit because I've been bonded for like millions of dollars, so I know that th it's not possible that I have a warrant. Uh, so I allowed him, or waited for him, allowed, right? Waited for him to return to his vehicle. Then I got out of my vehicle. He knew that I was not armed. He could see my hands. I walked up to the vehicle and I said, uh, can you give me some more information about the warrant? And then, uh, but, and it's still up on his screen. Okay, so now I can see what he's talking about for myself. And all it said was that I had been arrested uh, for petty theft and the charges were dismissed. Okay, so then um, I look at him and I say, I don't see a warrant. You know, I knew about that, you know, but that, that's not a warrant. And the asshole turns around and, and says, oh, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Yeah, right. Okay, that's just my, um, you know, I, I got a bunch of, uh, of stories. And just to let you know, I've never been convicted of a crime. I've been charged with various crimes, never did any of them, and always had charges dismissed. That's why I was able to be bonded for like huge amounts of money and basically work uh, wherever I wanted to work. All right, back to uh, the report. <coughs> Allegations of BPDs unreasonable use of force against juveniles are not new. BPD has a history of problematic encounters with youth that predate the period of our review. For example, in 2007, officers arrested a seven-year-old child for sitting on a dirt bike during an initiative to confiscate dirt bikes. Allegedly, although the dirt bike was turned off and was not securely locked or otherwise immobilized in violation of Baltimore City Code, according to court documents filed by the family's attorney, officers attempted to confiscate the bike and maliciously and unreasonably grabbed the child by his shirt collar and dragged him off the bike. According to the same documents, the child's mother informed officers that she intended to file a complaint and the officers in turn arrested the child. The family alleged he was handcuffed to a bench at the district station for hours and detained in question without his parents' consent. He was eventually released and never formally charged. This incident garnered widespread media attention in Baltimore and invoked a community outcry that BPD's aggressive tactics, particularly against a seven-year-old child. Despite the outcry and widespread attention, BPD failed to create policy guidance or comprehensive training for officers' interaction with youth. In addition, three officers were criminally charged this year for assaulting a youth who had been in crisis and was restrained in a 2015 incident. According to a complaint filed against the, about the incident, when the child was admitted to the hospital for evaluation of a mental health condition, Independent witnesses on the scene indicated that he had no injuries. In his hospital room, he was handcuffed with both hands behind his back, but was being unruly, yelling and kicking his legs. One of the officers reportedly ordered hospital staff to leave the room and reportedly slapped or punched the youth in the face repeatedly. The nurses observed the officers being verbally abusive to the child and observed injuries to his face when they returned to the youth's room. How many times you know, has that happened? Research has established that adolescent development affects the manner in which juveniles comprehend, communicate, and, and behave. These unique re realities of adolescent development warrant specific policies and tactics for officers' interaction with juveniles. The International Association of Chiefs of Police, IACP, has recognized this need and created guidance for officers' interactions with youth. Specific strategies for officers include approaching youth with a calm demeanor, conveying that you are there to help them because aggression may cause the youth to shut down and make the situation worse. BPD officers are not provided guidance on the causes and unique qualities of youth behavior and communication or trained on the skills and tactics necessary for interacting with youth. Officers use the same overly aggressive tactics they use with adults, unnecessarily escalating encounters with youth. As the President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing notes, 
Use of physical control equipment and techniques against vulnerable populations, including children, can undermine public trust and should be used as a last resort. We reviewed numerous other cases that have also raised concerns about officers' interaction with youths. These cases demonstrate that BPD fails to adjust its tactics even when dealing with youth. They also show that BPD needs to provide detailed and comprehensive policy guidance and training for interactions involving juveniles and to hold officers accountable if they fail to abide by their training and guidelines. Number four, BPD uses unreasonable force against people who are not a threat to officers or the public. A, BPD uses unreasonable force against people who are already restrained. <laughs> BPD uses unreasonable force against people who are already restrained and pose little or no threat to the officer or the public. In some instances, these individuals may continue to verbally resist or not submit to officers' demands, but this type of passive resistance or non-compliance is not justified using force. This practice contravenes well-settled law. In Myers, the Fourth Circuit determined that an officer's use of force was excessive and unreasonable where the officer repeatedly administered electric shocks from a taser on an individual who was no longer armed, was no longer actively resisting arrest, and was physically restrained by several officers. We also have stated in four forthright terms that officers using unnecessary, gratuitous, and disproportionate force to seize a secured unarmed citizen do not act in a excuse me in an objectively reasonable manner. And that's the court case, I guess, uh, Champion v. Outlook Nashville Inc. Uh, 2004. Uh, it cites we consistently held that various types of force applied after subduing of a suspect are unreasonable and a violation of a clearly established right. The court in Myers also indicated that any unnecessary, gratuitous, and disproportional force against unarmed and secured individuals was objectively unreasonable regardless of the type of weapon used, whether arising from a gun, a baton, a taser, or other weapon. In Baltimore, BPD officers use excessive force against restrained individuals. Often, when those individuals are awaiting transport to central booking after being arrested for committing low-level street offenses. For example, in a 2011 incident, three BPD officers responded to an anonymous tip about persons using illegal drugs inside a pickup truck. Arriving on scene, the officers located illegal drugs and drug paraphernalia in the truck's cab. The three occupants, two women and one man, were removed from the vehicle and arrested for controlled substance violations. While waiting for a prisoner transport vehicle, one of the women, Sarah, began moving around in a perceived attempt to wander away or escape. Sarah attempted to get up on six occasions and each attempt to rise was met with a verbal warning to stop and an admonishment, I'm sorry, and, and, and an admonition that the next time she tried to escape, the officer would use force against her. Sarah again tried to stand up and the officer already holding his police baton in his hand struck Sarah in the leg and then managed to maintain physical control over her. This baton strike appears to be used as punishment for failing to follow the officer's commands rather than necessary and reasonable force to control Sarah who was not actively aggressive and was being detained for a minor drug offense. Sarah later told the investigating supervisor that she was not attempting to escape, rather she was trying to stand up because her knees were in pain from kneeling on the hard pavement for such a long time. In this situation, other less forceful techniques should have been employed, for instance, an escort position, joint manipulation, or utilizing leg restraints if escape was truly a concern. Moreover, BPD specifically trains its officers that impact weapons should not be used when individuals are non-compliant or passively resisting. Rather, striking an individual with an impact weapon should only be used to stop an attacker who is actively attempting to inflict injury. Nonetheless, this strike against a restrained individual was summarily approved by the chain of command. In a 2014 incident that we reviewed, a city watch operator who was monitoring security cameras placed throughout Baltimore notified BPD patrol officers 
that he observed an unknown male, later identified as Brandon, conduct a hand-to-hand -hand exchange of suspected narcotics. An officer and a trainee responded to the scene and entered a local store to interview Brandon. After producing identification, the officers smelled an odor of marijuana emanating from Brandon, who they then patted down for weapons but found none. As they were exiting the store, BPD officers noticed a baggie containing a white powdery substance on the floor near the entrance where Brandon had been standing. According to their force reports, having seen no one else enter or leave the store, the officers determined that the baggie belonged to Brandon, handcuffed him, and took him outside to wait for a transport wagon. When a BPD sergeant arrived on scene, Brandon was sitting on the ground in handcuffs. The sergeant began speaking to Brandon and reportedly observed another small baggie containing white powdery substance and a clear sandwich baggie containing green plant material under Brandon's tongue. According to the sergeant, he asked Brandon to spit out the baggies, but Brandon's clenched his mouth and attempted to destroy the narcotics evidence by swallowing them. The sergeant placed his hand on Brandon's cheeks and most troublingly on his throat and then applied pressure. Not to restrict his breathing, but just to keep him from swallowing the illegal narcotic evidence which could have put Brandon's life at risk. When Brandon refused to spit out the suspected narcotics, the sergeant ordered the police officer trainee on the scene to tase Brandon even though he was restrained. The trainee drive stunned Brandon on his legs. When Brandon did not spit out the baggies, the officer ordered the trainee to dry stun Brandon three additional times. Brandon spit out several small baggies and was transported to the district for processing. The use of force on Brandon's neck, a handcuffed detainee who did not pose a threat to officer safety and who was being arrested for what the officer described in their own report as a street level drug transaction was excessive and unreasonable. Although some force to prevent the destruction of evidence or to protect Brandon may be reasonable, the sergeant's application of pressure to Brandon's throat was a use of lethal force that was not justified by the possible destruction of evidence or even the potential threat to Brandon of swallowing the narcotics. If Brandon had actually swallowed the baggies, officers should have transported him to a hospital for treatment by trained medical professionals. The officer's use of his taser on Brandon was also highly questionable, if not excessive. In a 2010 incident, Two BPD officers and a lieutenant arrested five foot six, 160 pound man for loitering after observing him throwing a cigarette, I'm sorry, a cigar wrapper on the ground and then emptied the tobacco contents from the cigar. The officers handcuffed and sat 19 year old William on a curb and conducted a search incident to arrest. They removed William's shoes and recovered a blue Ziploc bag containing what they suspected was marijuana. According to the force reports, William began to yell profanities and accuse the officers of planting the drugs. One officer placed William against the wall while they waited for a transport vehicle. William continued to yell when pushed off the wall and began to run. After only a few steps, an officer pushed William to the ground. According to the force report, William continued to flail and tried to strike the officers by headbutting, kicking, shouldering, and spitting. The officers attempted to gain control of William, but were unable. A crowd formed around the officers and William. Although William was in handcuffs and three officers were present to control the restrained man, the officers resorted to tasing the man in drive stun mode approximately six times. The lieutenant and one of the officers also reportedly kicked William several times either in an effort to get him to the ground or to keep him on the ground. The reports were unclear. When the drive stuns were reportedly ineffective, and William reportedly pushed away the taser and continued to fight, the lieutenant ordered the officers to move away and deploy two bursts of pepper spray in William's face. The officers were then able to hold William on the ground and place him in a transport vehicle. The inability of three officers to control William is concerning and reflects insufficient training on arrest and control techniques. While we take no position on the reasonableness of such much of the force used in this incident, the use of the taser on a handcuffed individual approximately six times was unreasonable. The use of a taser on a restrained individual is rarely reasonable and tasing the person in drive stun mode six times is unreasonable and excessive in almost any case. A drive stun is to be used only to create distance. William suffered abrasions on his knees, arm, back, and a small fracture of his left shoulder. 
He was charged only with loitering and disorderly conduct. BPD officers also use excessive force against restrained detainees who refuse to exit BPD transport vehicles, in some cases where being transported to the hospital for emergency petition evaluation. In a 2010 case, we reviewed a BPD transport officer responded to a call about a person with plausible or possible mental illness in a wheelchair, a wheelchair now, who was allegedly exposing himself to, to take him to a hospital for evaluation. Although the incident report is vague, difficult to read, and lacks any follow-up investigation, it appears that the officer approached the man, Timothy, who was agitated and disorderly, and asked for identification. Timothy produced his identification and then, then jumped out of the wheelchair and kicked the patrol car. When the officer attempted to take Timothy into custody, Timothy began kicking and the officer tased him and took him into custody. Timothy was transported to an area hospital for an emergency petition evaluation. Upon arriving at the hospital, Timothy refused to come out of the transport vehicle and kicked at the BPD transport officer. The transport officer gave Timothy several commands to stop kicking or he would be tased. A second officer stood outside witnessing the events, but there is no indication that he made any effort to intervene. After the transport officer gave Timothy a third command to stop kicking, the transport officer deploy, deployed his taser in drive-stun mode. The reasonableness of the first taser incident cannot be determined because there were conflicting accounts of what occurred. There were no supervisory investigation and the incident reports contained little detail. However, tasing Timothy the second time while he was restrained in the back of the transport vehicle was unreasonable. Because the subject was already in custody, the court analyzed the excessive force claim under the Fourth Amendment standard of whether the officer inflicted unnecessary and wanton pain and suffering. It held that excessive force claims brought by pretrial detainees need only meet the Graham standard of objective unreasonableness. In doing so, the court held that the use of a taser on a detainee who was already in handcuffs and restrained in the back of a police car was clearly unlawful despite the fact that the detainee was extremely unruly and uncooperative. Here, Timothy was transported to an area hospital because BPD officers determined that he needed an emergency psychological evaluation. Timothy was in crisis and kicked at the transport officer, but he was restrained and was not currently a danger to himself or a threat to the officers. There was no urgent need to remove Timothy from the transport van. Instead of having patients and attempting to de-escalate the situation or asking for assistance from the other officer on scene or qualified medical personnel in the hospital, the transport officer resorted to a high level of force to gain compliance from a person in crisis who may not have understood his commands. The use of the taser in this instance and in other similar BPD force files we reviewed was punitive rather than necessary and reasonable. All right, I'm going to stop this here. It's uh, 18 uh, minutes, and I will pick it up um, on uh, page 92 on the next recording. This, as I indicated, is going to take a while.